Welcome back from lunch. And now we're going to have a roundtable discussion. So every day we've invited collaborators to discuss with us um, issues emerging around food systems. And for today, we're joined by Magdalene Fogte, who is the program director at the Swedish International Agricultural Network Initiative, or CIANI, and uh, one of the core organizers of the Agri4D conference. Uh, Madeleine will discuss with two panelists um, the topic entitled UN Food Systems Process, an agenda for action for each one of us. Uh, welcome, Magdalene. Oh, thank you so much, Bridget. And uh, welcome all of you to our roundtable. Um, good morning and good afternoon and to everyone that is following the Agri4D conference here and from far away. So I hope that you all have uh, had a good breakfast or lunch and, uh, and that you will be able to participate. Um, we will dedicate this session to know a little bit more about what is going on with the UN food system process and the transformation that is called upon for now. Um, what does this call actually mean for us in general? And maybe since we, ha we are here at agri d what does it mean for researchers in particular? Um, and um, after the conversation we have here in the studio, we invite you all, or you can start already now, to write questions to us and uh, we'll try to answer them after our capacities. And uh, the moderator will bring us the questions, so don't hesitate. You can ask us for almost everything. And this, uh, I'm not going to speak all by myself. My voice is not that uh, in a shape that it allows me to speak that much. So therefore, I am super happy to have with me here two excellent speakers, Alexander Bongbe Bong Bystrom from the Swedish Ministry of Rural Affairs and Infrastructure, who is also the secretary for the Swedish FIO committee. And beside him, we have Professor Jenny Barron, uh, professor in agriculture water management here at SLU. So let's start. Welcome, both of you. Thank so you. good to have you here. Yeah, great. Um, so we have had uh, uh, various introductions this morning, and uh, we understand, and we did understand even before starting this conference, that unfortunately the word is off track. Uh, the SDG zero hunger is lagging far behind, even in reverse. And uh, <clears throat> so it is really now a call for efforts, more efforts, uh, investments, and also a s systemic change is now needed, and we need to act as fast as we can. It's also understood that if we can get this food system right, if we manage to transform the food system, this can be a really game changer. So all good forces and all actors are welcome as individuals and also as professionals. Research can help us to better understand the uncertainties, the complexities with all the crises that are challenging our development and research will also help us to support the transformation we need with evidence and data. So Alexander, um, we are running this conference every other year and 2021 we came out of a year full of energy after conducting food system dialogues. And at the same time as there was an Agri4D conference in Uppsala, there was a food system summit in New York, the first one. So um, I would like to ask you as a government representative in this dialogue to, to recall a little bit on the process and where we are heading and what you can see in this development. Happy to, Madeline, and thank you for, for having me and thanks to, to the organizers for, for having us as well. So I figured I'll start with some background about the general process of the 2021 Food System Summit that was convened by the UN Secretary General with the, with the background knowledge from, from the Secretary General that food systems is a very integral part to achieving the 2030 Agenda. There is no hope of reaching the, the global goals unless we have sustainable food system transformation with us. 
So, so that was the overarching aim, and to collect all the good forces, as Madeleine said, to, to uh, mobilize um, global efforts on, on this agenda and uh, put us forward towards 2030. <laughs> Um, so there, it was quite a huge process, actually, and, and uh, it took place during the during the COVID-19 pandemic, which which uh, had quite a large effect on the organization. But the one of the main entry points for the summit from the organizers' side was that it was supposed to be a people summit. It was supposed to be very inclusive and draw on, on, on knowledge not only from 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 governments but also from civil society, from private sector and from academia, not the least. So a people summit. And in this, in this spirit, uh, a key part of, of, um, of the summit process was dialogues, food systems dialogues. And I'll come back to that later because it's, it's still a mainstay and it's, uh, it's an avenue for engagement still. Uh, but um, leading up to the, uh, to the summit, uh, part of the process was that all the countries that were involved and all the actors uh, were expected to conduct food system dialogues with as broad a range of, of stakeholders as possible to, to gather as wide perspectives as possible and to also uh, sow the seeds of engagement from, from the ground level up. So it's not just top down, but, but also bottom up and, and uh, everybody all along the, the way uh, on board. Um, so that was the, that was the entry point. And um, speaking of, of, of the, um, the um, engagement of academia, that was very much throughout the, the process as well. And we had uh, prominent academics that were leading various action tracks and, and, um, and um, uh, themes of action uh, within, within the process. But uh, so if we fast forward a bit then to, to the actual summit in, in 2021, it was held in New York, as Madeleine said, uh, around this time of, of the uh, UN High Level Week. Um, so um, it didn't have a negotiated outcome. We didn't have a negotiated outcome document from the governments that participated, uh, but rather a uh, statement of action from the UN Secretary General in which he called for uh, all forces to, 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 uh, to unite and, and strive towards a sustainable food systems transformation so that we'll have a, a chance of, of, of uh, realizing the 2030 agenda. Uh, and as part of, of the outcomes from, from, uh, from the summit, uh, we saw one, a number of coalitions of action uh, which were uh, diverse groupings, uh, very, very different between themselves, uh, in which governments, UN agencies, civil society, academia and other actors uh, could join together, uh, join forces on certain topics. Or, uh, for instance, we have the school meals coalition, uh, in which government and others uh, engage to, to promote uh, more uh, usage of school meals as a, as a means for development. So that was one, the coalitions of actions. And then we also had national pathways that countries were, were asked to, to formulate on a voluntary basis. So national pathways towards sustainable food systems. And Sweden uh, developed one of these and uh, a number of countries did. Uh, I don't know the, the, the actual number now or how many countries have, have submitted their, their pathways so far, but I do know that uh, there are more than 100. Uh, so that was the second, the more national route, uh, and also as part, part of the of the pathways that were supposed to be informed by, again, these food system dialogues. So there were not only dialogues on a global level, there was also on a regional level and uh, national and local levels. So in Sweden, for instance, we conducted uh, seven uh, dialogues that informed, in turn, our, our national pathway. Um, so those were the two main areas of work pretty much that came out of the summit. Uh, as part of the, as I said, the, the main outcome document was, was a statement of action from the Secretary General. Uh, and in that, he, he one called for the uh, creation of a food systems coordination hub, which was supposed to be a uh, joint UN venture uh, led by the three Rome-based UN agencies, that is FAO, WFP and, and IFAD, but also uh, with the uh, UN Centrally and uh, UNEP and other parts of the UN system involved. 
So the idea behind the hub was, was uh, as the name uh, suggests, to, to help coordinate efforts, global efforts, uh, towards sustainable food systems uh, transformation. And the hub has since become uh, operational and uh, is very much, um, very much active in, in the work in, in coordination. But I'll come, come back to that um, as well. Uh, and lastly, one of the key points of the, of the Secretary General's statement of action was that he called for regular stock-taking moments. So every two years from the summit in 2021, leading up to, to 2030, uh, he will convene stock-taking moments to see where we're at, what's, what's the progress, what's going on, what's happening, uh, to keep the momentum going and, and, uh, uh, and uh, see where we're at. And that leads us to, to more present, present day, where the first stock-taking moment uh, was held in, or organized in, in July of this year uh, in, in Rome. Uh, so the 2023 uh, stock-taking moment. And uh, I was there, and, and Madeleine as well, uh, and uh, we were part of a, a very, very large gathering of people. It was very high attendance at this, at this uh, follow-up conference, which I thought was a very good sign that it signals that the food systems agenda is still very much uh, top of mind and very, uh, the momentum has kept going. Um, so the, the stock taking moment was, was convened again by the Secretary General of the United Nations and he was there himself in Rome to, to open the events, uh, after which his, his deputy uh, Secretary General uh, followed up. Um, and beside from, from a very large UN presence, uh, so it's not only the, the UN UN, uh, the UN Secretariat, it's the Rome-based UN agencies. We had various um, other funds and programs. We had WHO there covering the health side, for instance, and UNEP with, uh, with the environment side and, and so forth. So really from the UN system trying to capture the systemic approach uh, going across. And uh, we also saw very high engagement from, from, from countries and governments. So we had about 20 uh, heads of states uh, and, and government that was present, over 100 ministers and I think uh, about 3,300 participants uh, on site. So very much uh, a signal that, that the agenda is, is still ongoing and uh, that uh, the, the work continues. Again, though, we're, we're not dealing with an intergovernmental process that is uh, negotiated. So it's all very much based on uh, voluntary progress, voluntary reviews, um, sharing good practices and examples and, and trying to, to uh, get forward in that sense. Um, so now we're very much looking forward to after the stock taking moment, what, what happens now. So, of course, we have, as I said, since there will be uh, follow-up meetings every two years, we have a clear, the next goal post is very clear. So in two years time, we'll, we'll convene another, another stock taking moment and then uh, countries will, will uh, um, have to, to uh, show what they've done so far. But of course, it's not only countries, uh, it's, it's also very much uh, a collective effort and uh, albeit my, my personal reflection might be that the, the People Summit uh, approach that was very much um, the, the, the gist and the idea of the 2021 summit has maybe, was maybe slightly less reinforced now in the 2023 uh, stock taking moment, but nonetheless we saw very much interaction and engagement from from civil society, from academia, and, and also from, from private sector. And uh, one of the key outcomes, one of the calls for, for that came up, one of the themes that was most present during the stock taking moment was very much the, the need for, for, for um, science and innovation to, to scale up that and for, for countries and other actors to have uh, access to, to uh, and be guided by, by evidence and scientific results and that we need to have the scientific community on board uh, to be able to, to make these uh, changes in a, in a meaningful and, and uh, sustainable way. Yeah, thank you. So, <clears throat> to all of you attending the conference, you see there is a call now from the UN. We are needing all your knowledge. And uh, um, let's take a look then, just to recap a little bit what you said and uh, to make it more visual. So, here you see the UN Food Systems uh, Coordination Hub and the number of UN agencies involved. So, it's WHO, 
and uh, UNEP and others are, that are joining hands in this systematic approach to, to food systems, um, which is quite unique. And to support this hub, they have also uh, nominated a scientific advisory committee. And you see only half of the people here, but they are quite prominent, globally known, renowned uh, researchers on systems, but also coming in from all uh, aspects of research systems. And uh, so they had also, they were meeting now. And in I was present, as you said, and in almost all sessions, the call for science, the call for data was emerging in either it was the topic of a session or it was there, always present. Um, so now there has also lately been uh, a report, the Committee for Global Food Security is meeting in two weeks' time, and they will discuss and uh, deliver some policy guidance on data collection and analysis tools. And here, this has also been a consultative process for with research and researchers in Sweden, uh, based in Sweden, and also our colleagues that we know of have been uh, taking part of this uh, and, and contributed to the report. And we can also see the same call uh, at the UN highest level. So in connection with uh, SDGs, there was also a scientific group created to every four year present um, a global sustainability development report. And uh, you can, uh, it was launched last week uh, or during the UN summit now. And um, so this is a specific scientific group that is assisting the UN at the highest level with the uh, realization of the SDGs. And of course, they are also very well aware of that, the, 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 we are not on track. So we have to look at the future differently. And um, uh, the transformation could maybe be achieved with looking at different uh, possibility of synergies with, within different systems. And one of the um, major systemic change that is number third on this agenda, beside uh, human well-being and uh, so forth, is actually sustainable food system and healthy uh, health and nutrition. So, in the, in a various way, during, over time, this will link up with other systems that needs to be addressed, and uh, with those synergies. Possibly we can reach some of the SDGs, even though we are not on the track. Okay, Jenny, call for science. You are a science scientist, and uh, what is your reflection on this food system summit and UN processes? You as an academic working both in Sweden, but also internationally, and even with UN agencies you are collaborating. So, uh, some reflections. Uh, well, I I think it's uh, really I really welcome this invitation for scientists to engage in these high level policy, both at the international and the national level, and and the government's calling for that pol sort of scientific input into uh, understanding and to address the the uh, sustainability of food systems and the hopefully also a transformation of food systems. So personally, in in my particular field, which is soil and water for ag agriculture development. Um, we contributed to the background scientific report where, with more than 500, uh, maybe up to a thousand other co-authors that provided a synthesis of different dimensions of transformation of food systems in for, before the development of, uh, or before the UN Food System Summit actually took place. And, and it's really nice to see that the developments in Sen that Alexander was telling us about, um, uh, they continue to engage with high level scientists input for, for, for support, for advice and perhaps also for a little bit of academic challenge into the processes that are happening. Um, but for, for, for the everyday scientist, it's not always uh, so easy to be invited to the table. Um, and, and I think there are opportunities if we're taking this at the national level and maybe even at local level in these action pathways to consider how, how can we engage different disciplines, different academic insights into those dialogues uh, better. So, so there's also uh, 
an opportunity for more voices, but of course that we also ensure that we're bringing in the latest knowledge, the latest narrative, um, and also bringing uh, uh, and sensitizing researchers on what are the key questions forward. Uh, because this is, of course, not like we have all the knowledge today, but we have to continue to develop our knowledge, and especially around complexities such as transformation of our food systems. Yeah, <clears throat> it's... it's um... It's it's very well uh, needed, and um, but I, I'm wondering a bit. Do you see a need of building new data sets when we go into this system and holistic? Is there? I, I guess a lot of scientists are eager to try to start thinking of or what data do you think is crucial that we really well, provide to governments and uh, and uh, for this transformation? What do they need to know? Um, I can only speak for my own research field, where, where I work with soils and, and water resources in agriculture development um, and, and agriculture production systems, making the trying to work for more climate resilience, more nutritional outcomes. And this is something that we've had projects on in, in the last couple of years, um, also together with FAO, actually, um, and in how to link very um, separate sectors, such as the agriculture production and the water use in agriculture production, to nutritional outcomes for, for local people um, um, uh, by, by introducing uh, good agronomic practices, by using water efficiently, by using good soil health management strategies, for example. And these are very separate f fields, and it's not easy to even scientifically link how, how good uh, irrigation strategies end up being a nutritional benefit for a certain uh, young young youth or young people who are in desperate need of, of maybe more nutritional diets. So, so there are challenges and of course uh, many policies or development practitioners or even private sector, they want very quick answers, uh, very clear solutions oriented uh, responses from the academics. But here, because of the complexity, we need to work together. So um, there is data. Uh, but we need to work together to actually use that data and information and new knowledge in, in a practical way or in a policy relevant uh, way uh, forward. <clears throat> so would you say that uh, this, uh, this kind of development since the SDGs, I would say, like take 2016, has it changed also the way of um, how researchers work together. Is there now uh, more understanding of collaboration between disciplines and, uh, and seeking this kind of holistic approach? Because everyone enters with their knowledge uh, rather than uh, having a broader uh, knowledge scope. So I'm in, at that stage of my career that I've been in business for quite some time now. And certainly over the last 15 years, there's been a, a, a more awareness among researchers, both about the need to, to serve bigger issues such as policy questions or development questions or practitioners' needs, but also awareness about how you need to complement your research field, in my case, soil and water for ag development, with the nutritionist perspective or the gender perspective or the business model investment perspective to, to make my knowledge useful for, for other uses. And, and we need to have those interdisciplinary collaborations if we're seriously going to contribute new knowledge into food system transformations. But again, each each uh, issue is is it's it's a bit context specific. We don't have generic constellations of research groups to answer every aspect of a food system transformation. So we need to work together in in a specific contextual setting, of course. Yeah. Okay. So we have now come to a very interesting moment when we are. Um, asking your questions, so thank you. I have a whole 
uh, pile of questions here. And uh, I see that some of them are directed to you, <laughs> Alexander. Mm. So, um, why are we off track, despite of all these processes and high-level participation? Are these simply talk shops? Why are we off track? Um, well, I guess the, the simple answer is that reality happens. And uh, I, I mean, already before the, the COVID pandemic, we were, we were already way off track with, with uh, many or if not most of the sustainable development goals. And then, of course, with the pandemic, we got uh, set back even further. Uh, and uh, now we're not at a very, uh, we're not where we would want to be uh, with, the, with the global development agenda, of course. Uh, but uh, I think that the answer is probably somewhere, uh, I mean, these types of meetings and processes, of course, they can be very much perceived as as talking shops, not least when we don't have any tangible outcomes from, from them. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I think we need to, to be wary of and consider that uh, these are difficult issues that we're dealing with. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not easy. If it was easy, we'll, we'll just get it done. Uh, but um, frankly, it's not. And um, at least what I can see is that, uh, or my, my personal conviction is that uh, at least we have to treat to keep trying and we might not get all the way straight away, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get some, uh, we'll make continual and incremental process and, and uh, suddenly hopefully we'll, we'll, uh, we'll find ourselves at more of a transformational stage. But uh, of course, that's, that's a very, it's a poignant question and uh, bears reflecting. Yeah, <clears throat> it's, um, uh, we have to continue to talk to each other because otherwise sure. we'll never find any solutions in, in every situation. We can't lock us our, ourselves in. Uh, that won't help the development, at least. So uh, it's also another question, which is uh, all, when you have been on these meetings and um, uh, have you, what have you seen? Is there a challenge to include um, voices from marginalized groups? or? Do you think that the UN is uh, making more effort now or after the people summits or how do you see this process of inclusiveness? I mean, I, I would certainly hope that we've uh, made strides when it comes to inclusivity in, in these types of processes. And uh, I mean, just for, for instance, with, with the stock taking moment now, there was a specific session on indigenous peoples. There was a recurrent theme that we need to, to uh, listen to various marginalized groups that uh, are often also the most vulnerable to, to, to the challenges that we, that we face and the ones that stand to lose the most if we don't make progress and if we don't uh, achieve these, uh, these developments that we need to. But um, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I like to consider myself a fairly young person, uh, so my, I guess my, my, my scope isn't that far back, but I do think that there has been uh, substantial progress in, in that sense, that it's more inclusive now than, than it probably was. And if not, there are at least, um, we might not be all the way there, but, but we do have, we have youth representatives that are always there uh, in these types of processes. We have various marginalized groups. We have indigenous people's voices there. Uh, and I think that's, that's some steps of the way. And we also see way more, I mean, com coming from, from, from Sweden, I think we're one of the countries that have been quite progressive in this sense, both, both domestically and, and internationally. But now we also see more countries uh, calling for more inclusiveness and listening to other types of voices from, from other people and other groups that hasn't necessarily been, been listened to before. So I do think that there's prog progress there, but of course, uh, definitely more progress to, to be done as well. Yeah, there are. <clears throat> I also attended some sessions, there are also coalitions looking specifically at the most vulnerable groups, yes, so yes. making sure that uh, or with a broad participation of representatives from these groups and, and governments as well. And um, uh, so um, something, there is a bit movement, but uh, of course, it takes time. But uh, there is uh, interesting progress and understanding, and I think the understanding of the the food systems with indigenous people and vulnerable groups is also coming more through. Um, yeah. So Jenny, there is also a question here about the research. So what do you see? What is really the 
biggest challenge if you now go in and say, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to go and contribute to the food system's contribution at a global level as a researcher. What, do you know how to do that or would you, how would you do, proceed, you know? Um, I think it's a, it's a two-way two thing. I mean, as, a, as an academic and a researcher, I have to seek out where I can engage with these processes, both locally, nationally, and perhaps even internationally. But the other thing is, of course, that we get invited to the table. And, and whether what is the biggest research question or research issue or the biggest challenge for a transformation of food systems, I cannot as a single uh, a researcher come up with a response to that. But in, in the late, in this year, when we have in our country and in many other parts of the world, we had once again faced extreme weather events in multiple big food producing regions. Um, we had extreme droughts in the US, in, in Asia, in China, and of course we had it in Sweden this year. And, and having those kind of risks for the fundamental production uh, capacity is, is really something we have to deal with in addition to having the investments into sustainable and equitable food system um, uh, once we have the production facilities in place. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what do you think also, as a researcher, the inclusion of the actual food producers in this process? How, how can they help you as a researcher? And how, how are you making sure that the food producers are within the process? So here also, you mentioned the marginalized group. They are marginalized, they produce food, and they don't have enough to eat. But we have also normal food producers, so what is the process for them? But the food producers, you talked about this kind of climate, uh, severe climate uh, um, events. So from a researcher's side, how do you take care of their questions and uh, within these systems also? This is questions from the audience. Yeah. We, we have uh, different ways to do it and me uh, personally, we have uh, quite a lot of on-farm as well as uh, consultations with farmer and farmer representatives uh, in, in design of, of our research, in, how, in, in what type of questions we address and prioritise within our research. And very often we have farmers involved in in the actual research projects. Um, in in the Horizon Europe, which is a very big European funder of research across all European countries, we have also the opportunity to work with farmers in other countries and have exchanges of knowledge both between researchers and farmers or farmer representatives. And uh, the model is called Living Labs, um, which is uh, really where you co-create uh, new knowledge between different actors, including researchers, of course, but also farmers, landowners, perhaps uh, po uh, policy representatives or other practitioners or uh, private sector actors in the production of, of research and new knowledge for, for sustainable food systems. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Alexander, how are they represented? So just, just one example of, of how we work from, from Sweden and uh, drawing, you, you mentioned earlier that I'm also uh, the secretary of the Swedish FAO committee, which uh, Madeleine is, is also a member of, uh, is, which is a committee where headed by, by uh, the state secretary of, for rural affairs, uh, where we gather people from, from academia and, and civil society and uh, various government agencies, but we also have farmer represent representatives on the committee and we regularly not only do we engage with this this committee when we talk about international agricultural issues uh, speaking of FAO but we also regularly as Sweden invite the the committee members to take part of of delegations to to various international meetings and summits such as the the, the um, stock taking moment so we do provide the the place also in our delegations uh, for for uh, 
for farmers and, uh, and uh, other groups. So we get a diverse set of, of opinions and views and uh, that to get the cross fertilization as well. So not only that we get these voices in, but also that uh, these voices get, uh, get some feedback and get something back that they can take back to their communities and, and continue to work with and hopefully uh, draw something from as well. So that's a practical example of how we yeah, I think that is also one of the questions here. How can a country like Sweden fac facilitate also these kind of contacts between different groups and different countries in, in, uh, in the more global system? Um, so, um, uh, yeah. So how can we help then all these countries to get on track to achieve the SDGs Paris Agreement? and everything else we promised by, um, by 2033 and 2035. Is there, a, is there a silver bullet for that one? I mean, I, I, I wish I had an easy answer to that. That would make uh, all our lives uh, much easier. But uh, unfortunately, uh, no, I, I, I don't have a, a very simple, uh, simple solution uh, to that. I think it's very much about uh, what we've already been talking about, it's uh, staying engaged and uh, trying to find cross-sectoral and interdisciplinary uh, cooperations and solutions and, and um, strive on ahead. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, no, unfortunately, no, no easy answer to, to how, we, how we do it. And the research community, how can you help? I mean, the, we are in a world where distortion takes place also because of uh, the information and, uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, we have the so-called fake news and, uh, and all that spectra. And here, I guess, research is always important. Yeah, but one, how can we get One it thing to... that Sweden has done and has a long history uh, and experiences is building capacity, uh, both at, at a lower level, but of course at academic levels as well, in developing country partnerships. Um, and this has been really important to, to give opportunity to youth and to new generations of researchers um, on agriculture development, food system transformation, and also for countries to provide their own capacity to develop their own data sets uh, around their food systems or agriculture productions or other natural resources, which are key. Um, so um, as an academic, our, our job is to work together with our colleagues in different countries and thereby also provide input into the capacity building of new gener generations of, of expertise uh, and technical expertise that can as af affiliate with, with their uh, policy engagement processes, both globally, but of course nationally as well. And this is a really important role that, that Sweden has been provided during many years, and I hope that we can continue doing in the future. Yeah, and <clears throat> also to mention that SLU is uh, particularly good at this with um, collaboration and also uh, publications with scientific articles with uh, colleagues, uh, researchers uh, in other countries. Uh, yeah, so now uh, the last question goes to you, Alexander. Everyone has so many questions to you. Oh, well. uh, and, uh, but um, there, there are people now in the audience, so they wonder, they really want to get involved as a researcher or innovator or even uh, agripreneurs. We have a lot of them here also attending our uh, conference. So how can they get involved? If they want to get involved, what should they do? What do you, any clue? So I, I'd say a very tangible point. So go in your, in your search engine and, and go to the Food Systems Coordination Hub's website. Uh, and there you can have, they, as I said earlier, a, a large part of this process is, is dialogues. And they continuously um, organize various dialogues on, on different topics uh, concerning various parts of the food systems. And these are very much open and uh, you can start by, by registering for, for one of these uh, dialogues that are hopefully coming up soon, uh, the next one, and um, join the conversation. Start making interactions with, with people within the, within the development space and, 
and see where you can contribute. That's a very uh, firm one and I'm, I, I myself uh, partake in, in many of these dialogues and it's a very good opportunity to, as Jenny also said now, with sharing experiences is, which is a very big part of, of the entire process. I mean, as I said just now, I don't have the, a big answer to the big question, how do, we, how do we solve all these problems? But of course we can have smaller answers to, to smaller questions that form part of the bigger problem. Uh, and, and in that sense, these, these dialogues are a very, very useful, useful tool and uh, means of engagement. So uh, I'd start there and uh, take it from there. Yeah, that's good advice. And do you have any advice, Jenny, on this? It's more on... Keep reading the new, latest science every now and then as well to update on, on the understanding of of numbers and questions that might be of relevance for uh, <coughs> food yeah. systems. And, and this research, the Scientific Advisory Committee, is now also producing pub, uh, you know, um, articles around the food systems. They are very much coming up. And in, in maybe last resort, but not a bad resort, uh, on the Siani website, you will also be able to follow quite a lot of uh, what's going on. And we have a specific uh, space where um, knowledge and news on food system process is also published and also researchers who, who contribute to this and uh, we also encourage you all to to contribute more um, yeah I think we are closing so I just want to thank you both for for joining this um, conversation and, and round table. I think we had a good conversation and I would like to see this conversation also to continue. And I think it's really um, <laughs> very important that, um, and that we recognize that we need science and we need science that is, uh, that capture the holistic uh, problematics, is multidisciplinary equitable and also inclusively produced so we get the right questions we don't have much time we have to focus on what is important this science and knowledge should be openly shared and it should be by trusted sources because we are also battling every day uh, all kind of uh, news and information which is not from very trusted sources should be socially robust and relevant for most society. So, in one sense, science is needed for policy. And, and uh, it's also so that science also needs good policy and governance to be able to contribute. So I, my hope with this uh, roundtable is that you as a researcher now feel more encouraged that this focus on the system, you work in collaboration with others, with the government, with local farmer groups, with other disciplines, uh, is, is, is something that can also contribute to our uh, joint effort. And that is actually that we one day will reach the goal that we have set, that is zero hunger and a sustainable food system. Yeah within the planetary boundaries. So I would like to thank you. How about that, Bridget? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, as a researcher, specifically a researcher from a developing country, I'm very excited to hear about the inclusivity, the fact that uh, more space has been created for scientists, and also that there's co-production of knowledge where fellow researchers are making efforts through uh, things like uh, living labs, to really engage with the co-producers, to engage with the producers and co-produce knowledge because they're the ones that are experiencing the food insecurity, they're the ones that are producing the food. So we're really grateful for that and all, all the best in these endeavours. So for now, we're going to break for 15 minutes. Please stretch away from your laptops and take a break. And at the end of that, we'll go back to our uh, panels. And please make sure that you join one of these very exciting panels. And we'll see you here at 15 hours um, uh, Central European time for the wrap-up session. See you then and all the best.